title of the message is this morning, Simeon's dream was accomplished. Simeon's dream was accomplished. And let's go to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. And we're going to actually start on verse 20. And then we're going to read through verse 38. So the Bible reads, Then the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen as it was told them. And when eight days were completed for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Now when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses, was completed, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Verse 25. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and he blessed and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. And Joseph and his, and his mother marveled at these things which were spoken of him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and the rising of many in Israel and for a sign which will be spoken against. Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Now there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Penuel and the tribe of Asher, and she was of great age and had lived with her husband seven years from her virginity. And this woman was a widow of about 84 years and did not depart from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And coming in that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him and to all those who looked for redemption in Jerusalem. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you for all the details. Thank you that you're a God of detail and you're also a, a God of great patience. And Lord, you came to fulfill the promises and the prophecies. Thank you for these uh, two older uh, saints, Lord, that were so sensitive and they were able to be there on that exact time to bless you. And Lord, thank you that we want to learn from them and being sensitive to the Holy Spirit. And, and Lord, just getting so much out of this uh, Christmas day as we're honoring your birthday in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can't stop the message of Christmas. It's going out all around the world. Even... Even secular nations celebrate Christmas. You know, if you go into some of these places like Iran and uh, you'll go into the back country and they'll have a Christmas tree there, they'll be <laughs> celebrating Christmas. And uh, it's because the news has gotten out. Whether we know the details of the news, the Lord wants to give us, you know, more of the good news in our hearts. And this is a fun uh, testimony that... Um, in secular society, sometimes they want to say Xmas and take Christ out of Christmas, and, and they'll say Xmas trees for sale. But see, this is a joke, though, on society because X means in Greek 
Christos. It means Jesus Christ. So even when they're trying to X out Christ, you can't. Even the X means Christos, Jesus Christ. Isn't God awesome? Amen. You can't X out, you know, the one who gave the light and the love. But there's these two saints, and it's Simeon and Anna. And they had a dream, and they were getting older, and they're at their, their final, you know, stage of life. And, but they were hoping in this prophecy. God had promised them that they would see the Messiah before they finished their course here in this life. And we need to know, too, that, that God wants us to have a hope in a prayer, in a dream, coming into 2023. The dream, hopefully, will be his dream, which is to uh, preach the gospel of Jesus Christ so that all people can hear the good news and, and be ready for his second coming, amen, when he comes again. And I was up at Cal's Mountain, and I was, I was fixing the cross up there this week is, is you know, a good godly tradition, and uh, this Cambodian couple came by, and they were watching, and, um, and they, were, they were just intrigued. And then they said, are you the one that keeps rebuilding the cross? And I said, I am the one that, that does it. They said, oh, we are so encouraged. We see the cross broken down, and then we see it rebuilt again. And they said, it encourages us. They said, do you know that our... Our children, we send our children to a Christian school, and, and we believe in, 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 you know, the cross, and, and I, I asked them, and of course, we, we talked, and, uh, and I said, are, are you, are, do you know that Jesus is living in, their, in your heart? And they said, and they were sad, they said, no, no, he's not living in our hearts. I said, do you want to receive Jesus into your heart? And they said, yes. I mean, it was so dynamic and beautiful. And so we said that prayer up there, and they asked Jesus to come into their heart, and they were so joyful and gave big hugs and everything. Um, but see, God's got a mission for you and I, and, and it's to share the good news with our gifts and how we're going to do it. But we're going to see here that Mary and Joseph were chosen uh, by God because they they were just and they followed their hearts their conscience and God could entrust them with you know carrying out these these um, Jewish um, it, it's it's symbolism but it's also a dynamic obedience and here here's what happens okay is that the shepherds they're all excited, right? They preach the good news. They come out with baby Jesus. And then it says in verse 20, we read it, that the shepherds returned, glorifying, praising God for all the things they had heard and seen and was told them. So the shepherds left. And now the, in eight days, now the way it works is, is after the birth of the child, the woman has to separate herself for seven days because, you know, there's blood and everything else. And then on the eighth day, they called in the local rabbi there in Bethlehem, and they did the circumcision on baby Jesus. And, um, you know, the, uh, the song that says, Away in a manger, no crib for his bed, the little Lord Jesus, you know, lay down his sweet head. And then there's a, another verse that says, no, you know, he's so good, he, no crying he makes, right? Well, I can guarantee you after circumcision, Jesus cried, okay? You can kind of chuckle. It was a procedure, and it was painful, and, uh, and he had to go through it. And the parents, you know, this was a part of their tradition. And so um, Jesus had some time, amen, to heal up. And, um, and then they, they were off, um, you know, to... Uh, also, in, in the eighth day, they named Jesus. So they were there in Bethlehem because they were, uh, uh, there was a census. But also now, he's a newborn. Just like when we're born, right, we have to write down our name in the hospital, right? They record your name. And uh, some, some parents today, I've heard it, that they don't even have a name and they don't even name their, ch 
their child, you know, when their child is born. It's kind of a goofy thing in our culture. But, um, but you better be ready, right, on that day to know the name. And so they knew the name, right? Why did they know the name? Because Gabriel had told them the name to name their son, right, the son of God, name him Jesus. So see, his name was recorded in Bethlehem, and, uh, and his parents, see, are following out the traditions. And, um, I mean, when we uh, were birthing our first child here in, at Grossmont Hospital, I, we didn't have ultrasound at the time, so I just kind of felt that God was giving us a boy first. And I just had it, and I was thinking about that. And then Dr. Mack, after the delivery, he said, you have a, a beautiful baby girl. And I'm like, whoa, amen. But I knew, I knew what we knew who, what to call her. We had already said, you know, we had Sarah and we had Caleb. I thought it was going to be Caleb and Sarah, but no, it was. And then later we had the Caleb, right? But it's, a, it's not according to, to our plan, but it's good to have a name. But God had that name. What is his name? His name is... Jesus, amen, which means Jehovah is salvation. He's the Messiah. He's the deliverer. And, and that's why we have to see, too, in our life that it's a dramatic thing. Salvation is a dramatic thing. Salvation changes our, our whole world. Salvation changes the way we think, the way our behavior, our entertainment. It, it just sets us free so that our focus is not on ourself anymore. Our focus is on knowing him and, and making him known and learning his character and his ways. And then there's joy unspeakable, hope full of glory. But we really do need to know the power of that name. The demons tremble. And every knee shall bow, and every tongue will confess that Jesus is the Christ. He is the Lord. Whether people are obstinate, and they, they may be fighting against him now, and big business and, and government may be fighting against him, but you know what? One day, if they, if they you know, don't repent, they're going to be bowing their knee before the Lord, before their judgment time comes. But let's bow our hearts now. And revel in his name, that we're under his name, the son of the living God. So the common custom was after Jesus was named in Bethlehem and circumcised, he recovered. And then there was a purity law in the Old Testament that for 40 days they purified themselves. And for a male, a, a male child, they would go to the temple and 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 celebrate and dedicate their, their child to the Lord. And, um, and so we see both Joseph and Mary were at the temple. Now, um, normally, uh, you know, a Jewish man can go right in to the temple to a certain place, but they were hanging out in the court of the Gentiles, which was the court of women, because women at that time could only go to the court of women. And Joseph is there with Mary. Now, the reason is, too, is Joseph delivered baby Jesus. Joseph delivered, so ceremonially, he was, he was unclean. He had to purify himself as well for 40 days. That's why when he approaches Simeon, um, and Simeon, and they come to him in the temple, they're waiting in line, you know, this couple uh, for, for blessing, to bless their child. And, and that's why, of course, in church, that's why we bless children. You know, at a certain time when they're young, the younger, the better, but at any time it's good. But bless them, dedicate them to the Lord, before the Lord. And this is a, a biblical thing. Um, you know, birthing a child, I, I have a, a friend that where I'm a chaplain, and he has a fun story that um, he, he lives out in Ramona, and so he couldn't get to the hospital in time, and he had his young wife, and they were getting, you know, to trying to get over to Escondido to the hospital, and she just birthed the baby right there in the car. So uh, he had to, you know, he had to be there, and he'd never delivered a baby before, but right there in the hospital parking lot, you know, he delivered the baby, and and then uh, somebody had to come out and the doctor and they took care of the rest. But uh, he was just sharing that. So recently he was having another son and I called him and I said, how's the delivery going? He says, 
He says, well, she's about ready to go, but I'm staying here at the hospital with her. I'm not taking a chance again, you know. Cause, so anyways, yeah, you know, that's, that's quite a responsibility as a man. Joseph, right, he had a single guy, you know, he'd never delivered a baby before. We got to give him a hand clap, right? <laughs> Amen. What a great experience, and, and he did it for us. And, but we have to see that Joseph and Mary, when they came to the temple, they were, they were a, just a traveling couple, a peasant couple that blended in with, with everybody. They came to the temple. Now, this is why we have to understand the biblical history. We learned last week how important it was that the wise men came, right, following the star. They came through Jerusalem. They alerted with their, their army, right? They alerted Herod was on guard. And then they went and they delivered the gifts to the children. But in, in Matthew 2, we find out that right after that, then God gave Joseph a dream and said, get Jesus right out of here, right, and take him to Egypt. So there's, you know, there's a, there's a two-year gap right here. And we don't, don't think that it's not biblical. It's just that it, it, just, it, it flows in the proper order. The wise men had come two years later when Jesus was two years old, and he could travel 250 miles to Egypt. But now what we're seeing here is when the shepherds came and they proclaimed, and everybody's all excited, see, they were poor. The shepherds were poor and they were despised and they were not respected by society. So they had all the good news and they were telling one another, but nobody, nobody in the elite group, what, they weren't listening to the shepherds. They didn't care what the shepherds said. They were saying, the, the, you know, the, the Messiah is born, and I saw an angel, and, they, and it was going at, but nobody cared. The elites and the, and the religious people didn't listen to them. So see, this is where Jesus comes in, baby Jesus, with, with Mary and Joseph. They're walking in the temple. They're at peace. They don't, Herod doesn't have a clue, right? And, and so they're, walk, they're waiting in line, and, uh, and this is Jesus coming in, in humility because he was born into a lower-class family. Now, a carpenter was a decent job at that time, but the taxation made them very, very poor. So he was, you know, in, and nobody suspected him. So we have to stop and think about the Christmas message. Who did Jesus come to? He came to these humble shepherds. He came to these humble, you know, uh, older people that were willing to listen and learn, right? And, um, and so he also is, um, you know, coming in humility in our lives. That's why humble ourselves under the almighty hand of God, and he will exalt us in due season. Humility is constantly needed, can't be overemphasized in our life. That, you know, life is, is a humbling process. And that's why we need to keep regaining strength and, and vision in the Lord. And that's why we're here in the house of God on his birthday, just to learn some more things about Jesus. And here's another thing about humility. They're offering doves, right, as their sacrifice in the temple. Now, if you, if you should, for a son, you should offer a lamb, but they couldn't afford a lamb. They had come all this way, and they were, at, you know, and they were staying in Bethlehem. They had to rent a, a house and everything. So here, here's the Savior of the world, and they have the poorest offering, and they're two turtle doves, you know? And, um, and so how many of you like to hear the doves in the morning, you know, they're they're really fun to hear. They're very peaceful for the most part, sometimes a little annoying. But, um, but they're, they're a, generally, they're a peaceful bird, all right? And um, so it's a peace offering. It's very simple. And, um, and so here's another thing. Nobody who was in Herod's group or the religious group, they weren't looking for a peasant couple. They, weren't look, they were looking for somebody who was of the upper class, somebody who at least could offer a lamb for a sacrifice. So they didn't even consider, you know, Jesus and, uh, because of their pride and their lack of understanding in the scriptures. So there was no fanfare for his birth. There was no new, you know, uh, new, uh, it wasn't uh, shouted from the news. It wasn't on Fox News. It wasn't on the Internet, right? It was all hidden. And here's the king of creation 
comes in, the Word of God, who made all things, and he comes in this humble form. And so you and I, too, we can humble ourselves. And, but how about um, Christmas? Like, a trillion dollars was spent. A trillion dollars in Christmas gifts, and, and gifts keep getting more and more expensive. And we just have to say, um, and we want everybody to know the meaning of Christmas, but we all have to agree that sometimes people get a little bit too commercialized. Christmas becomes too commercialized. We get so far away from the original meaning and the humility of what it was all about that, um, that we have to kind of stop ourselves and um, take an assessment. Now, I'm just going to read to you what society was like in the birth of Christ, and I'm going to read this to you and, and kind of see if you can see some of the parallels in our world today. The people of that time were being heavily taxed. They faced every prospect of a sharp increase uh, cover, expanding military expenses, um, and, you know, we just spent like, you know, 8.5, you know, what is it, a billion, billion dollars that we're putting into our defense, the threat of the world uh, domination by a cruel, ungodly, power-intoxicated band of men was ever just before the threshold of consciousness. Moral deterioration had corrupted the upper levels of society and was moving rapidly into a broad base of the populace. So intense nationalistic feelings were clashing openly with new and sinister forms of imperialism. Conformity was the spirit of the age. Isn't this amazing? This is the way it was when Jesus was born. Government handouts were being used with increased lavishness to keep the population from rising up and throwing out the leaders. Huh? How about, you know, have you ever heard of stimulus checks and things like that? Well, that, that's what they were doing. How contemporary. Interest rates were spiraling upward in the midst of an inflated economy. External religious observances were considered a political asset. An abnormal emphasis was being placed upon sports and <laughs> athletic competition. I mean, what are they trading these baseball players for and football players you know 300 million dollars for you know i mean that do we agree that's a little bit too high right for a sports figure but we're putting too much emphasis that's what was going on here racial tensions were at a breaking point in such time amidst the people and then in the midst of this a child was born right and a son is given and jesus is the hope of every person if we put our hope in him and so we see that Emmanuel God with us oh don't we need Emmanuel in our time and he's there with us and the more that we press into that friendship with God the more light that we have the more joy that we have the more you know people around us are perishing all these same things are happening in our very own time and how desperate people are for the Messiah and so, you know, the, 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 uh, everybody was, was these young, these uh, humble people were ready. Herod was not ready. Herod was the king of the Jews. And he didn't have a clue. He was looking for some powerful man. And he was so self-medicated and so, you know, so lustful and so, you know, into his own power that he couldn't even see baby Jesus. He, he wasn't even looking for him. And then the scholars who should have known from the scriptures, right, that he would be born, right, of a virgin, right? What's that? Born of a virgin, that means a baby, right? Isaiah 7, 14. But see, they were so into their scholarly pride and opulence that they didn't see it. And um, a lot of religious people didn't see it. But but here's the beautiful thing, that Simeon saw it. And that's what we want to emphasize here. Let me just read verses 25 and 26. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. 
And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Now, Simeon, there's not a lot about him, but we know that he's a, a priest and a Levite, but he's, he's like a low-level priest. And he's in the temple a lot, but he's kind of eccentric. So in other words, they're, they're, he's, he's really walking in holiness, but the people aren't really you know, valuing that. And so they think he's a bit eccentric, just like sometimes people in our society today, they say, you know, don't take your Christianity too seriously. Oh, my goodness. Take it very seriously, right? <laughs> and, and really, uh, you know, walk with the Lord, right? And, and because we don't want to be distant from the Lord. We're a Christian. We're Christ-like. Christ is in our heart. Christ has come in our heart. Christ has changed us, right? We, don't, we, we, we have a new, a better way of living. We have a clean conscience, and, and we want to keep a clean conscience serving the Lord. But, but Simeon, they thought he's a bit eccentric. He's out there. He's always looking. Can you imagine every day he's in the temple, or as much as he can be? He's got, you know, he's got his work. We don't know how close he lived. Probably lived fairly close. But every day he was out for years. Every day he's out looking for a young couple. He's out looking for a baby, a young couple. And then each day, each year, right? And, and, and then are they the right ones? And, and then the Holy Spirit says, no, they're not the right ones. But keep looking. Keep looking, Simeon. How about you and I when, it, when we're to be looking for the coming of the Lord? When we're to be looking for the signs of Jesus appearing, he's coming back again. The rapture is real. It's coming at just the right time. It's coming at, in a day, in a moment, in a twinkle of an eye. We don't know. Is it today? Is it tomorrow? Is it two years from now? We don't know the day and the hour. But the Lord wants us to be looking just like Simeon. Is this the one? Is this the day, right? Is this, is this my last opportunity to share Christ today? I'm going to have more boldness today. But every day, until he was an old man, he was looking for the Christ. And God told him, because, you know, the Holy Spirit, the Old Testament, only the prophet, the priest, and the king could have an intimate relationship with the Holy Spirit. That's the way it was in the Old Testament. And so um, everybody else followed the law, and they followed good leaders, but it was a different system. That's why you and I also are so blessed, because we're living in the New Testament, that we have every believer has the fullness and the full potential of the Holy Spirit. That's a beautiful thing that, you know, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, Jesus wants to dwell within us in his fullness, and so Simeon, Amen. Was looking, and uh, and so one day. Come on, let's check it out. One day. Every say that golden day, that glorious day. One day he comes to the temple, and his heart probably was. You know, who knows what it was like? Maybe it was a hard morning. It usually is, right? Probably a harder morning, right? And 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 you've been doing this for so many years, and. And they think that you're eccentric, and they think that you're an oddball, and, and, and why, you know what? You're not feeling so good, and your bones are aching, you're getting older. Why don't you just stay home today? You know, because that's usually, you know, there's opposition. That's why we've got to press through our opposition. That's why, too, fasting and prayer is so beautiful and powerful, and I hope that you get the notes and prepare your hearts And as we're coming in. And by the way, uh, brothers, we're not... We're not having a pancake breakfast on Saturday the 7th because we're going to be fasting, right? <laughs> but it's cute. It's just a little bit ahead, but we're going to skip that first Saturday because we're, we're in a fasting time. Amen. We want to prepare and, and be ready. And, and so Simeon had to shake himself. I believe it because you know what? There was spiritual warfare that morning. And he says, you know what? I've been doing this so many years and I believe God and the Holy Spirit told me that I would see the Son of God before I die. I'm getting up and going. And so he ends up in the temple and there's this young peasant couple with this, you know, a beautiful baby boy, but the anointing is on Jesus, the word of God. He came, he had, 
He had so conditioned his heart that he knew that he knew. And he said, can I hold him? Can I hold him in my arms? And he was able to see, you know, the call of God, that the Messiah, the, the, the Son of God, 4,000 years of, of prophecy. And Simeon's holding him in his hands. And, um, and he's just, the consolation, you know, consolation means the peace. Consolation means that no more, lay down your struggle. Lay down your, our willfulness. Lay down our pride. And, and, and let the consolation come. Let the peace come. Let the, let the life, the calling of God, the, the, the simplicity. See how, what if Joseph, like, you know, just the call of God is whatever he's called us to do. Look at Simeon. He was a low-level priest, but he was so high in the, in, the, in the estimation of God. See how sometimes in our society people are striving for titles and striving for wealth and striving for their own identity. And God just says, rest in me. You know, be faithful to me. And look at Simeon. He gets to see Jesus, the Son of God. And uh, boy, was he fulfilled on that day. And uh, so his, his, he, he had a glorious day, right? And now he says, now, he says, I can, I can die now. I can depart in peace because I've seen the Son of God. He says, I, I'm ready to go, right? And um, so you and I, too, are we, are we ready, you know, if God calls us? Or, or are we like, oh, I'm not really sure. Well, the thing is, is it's human to fear and doubt, and then it's supernatural to press into the Word and get our confidence that we can say humbly, yes, I am ready today. I'm ready to give my life today. I'm ready to live for the Lord. I'm ready to die for the Lord. I just want to, I want to glorify the Lord. And, um, and so Simeon was in that position. So, wow, what a, what a strong way to finish. Well, let's, um, let's go to um, verses 36 through 38. And we're going we're gonna to learn here about Anna and uh, another humble one that's prepared. And I'll just re read that again. It says in verse 36 of Luke 2, now there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Penuel, the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age and had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. And this woman was a widow and about 80, of about 84 years who did not depart from the temple but served God with fastings and prayers night and day and mourning in that instant that she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke to him to all those who looked for redemption in Jerusalem. Okay, now Anna, Anna was probably about 105 years old, okay, because she, she let's just say, let's just say she got married really young, which would be 14, okay, and then she lived with her husband for seven years, from her virginity, so that she was 21. So if you add 84 and 21, you would come up with about an age of about 105. So she's this 105-year-old woman. And from, you know, and, and to be a widow in that time was very difficult because sometimes if you weren't a high-level widow, they could overlook you in the temple and you wouldn't get re resources. They, they said that they would care for you, but if you didn't have a name or a title or, or a, you know, somebody pressuring. And she was from the tribe of Asher. We need to understand this, that when, when Israel was divided, this is going way back, but they divided ten nations and then two nations remained. And so Asher, was, with Asher went off into captivity hundreds of years ago. So Asher was almost like the people that were dwelling now in Israel, they had returned from captivity. She, she was of a, a low level, almost like not even registered in Israel. And this woman is a widow, and they're despised in society. But she finds herself in the temple. Nothing's going to stop this woman from being in the temple. Even though her forefathers messed up, 
But you know something? Even though maybe our, our, you know, our parents weren't all that they should be, maybe they were, thank the Lord. But each person has to determine in our hearts what we're going to do in our generation for the Lord. But this woman had a lot of odds against her. And she would come. And I'm sure she wasn't eating lavishly. But on the little bit that she had, she was, she was praying and fasting in the temple for years, years, seeking God, you know, and, uh, and, and waiting. And God told her, God told her. And see, that's why Jesus elevates women in the Bible. Do you know that when people, you know, in some modern, uh, you know, they'll, they'll put Jesus down as if he's an oppressor. No, no, Jesus is the liberator of women and all people. He's broken every curse. But this is the first evangelist. She's 105 years old, and she's clear, and she's seeking God, and she comes up at that moment, right? The moment. See how the moment of the Lord, just the timing of the Lord, that she's right there when Simeon is blessing, you know, baby Jesus. And there's, there's old Anna. Everybody say, there's old Anna. And she comes up, and she just sees what's going on, and she starts proclaiming. She starts proclaiming in an instant she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke to him to all those who looked for redemption in Jerusalem. And so, wow, just this beautiful uh, woman of God that, you know, was sacrificial. And so that's why we need to keep the vision is that Jesus, you know, I, I believe he's shown us very clearly in prophecy what the end times would look like. Well, they're looking like it. And so things are kind of falling apart all around us, but really in prophecy, everything's falling into place because we're getting closer to the coming of the Lord. We're getting closer to his kingdom. You know, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Christ and he will reign forever and ever. So sometimes in the crumbling of things, we want to try and hold it all together. Now we should hold what's good and hold fast to what's good but when something is crumbling, then you cleave to what is secure. And that's the word of God. That's the prophecy. That's, that's his coming kingdom. And, um, and so uh, Anna did it, and uh, Simeon did it, and Joseph and Mary did it. But, but they, were, you know, they were a remnant, a remnant of believers. They weren't in the mass of crowds. The mass of crowds, the religious people, didn't have a clue. Herod didn't have a clue. But the humble did, and they were crowned with salvation. So in conclusion, in spite of her circumstances, right, she was despised, a widow. She could have tried to remarry. God told her not to remarry. So she had to live in, in, in poverty and, hum, and humiliation. But she kept her dignity, and she knew where to find it. She was in church. The temple was like church. She was serving in the church. She was serving there. She was like determined. And in spite of her singleness, in spite of the corruption of the religious leaders, she stayed focused. See, sometimes people say, well, you know, uh, you know people are corrupted, and so I, I think I'm just going to be corrupted. No, 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 no. It's a, that's a temptation that's common to man. But just because people or friends or people around us, you know, uh, have corrupted themselves, that, that's just an opportunity to pray. And it's an opportunity also to be faithful so that when, when they come around or when they repent, then you're walking with the Lord and you can give them words of life. But if we fall down with everybody else that's falling down and we're all in the cesspool together, who, who are, who's going to help, Right. And so the Lord wants you to be strong. Turn to your neighbor and tell him, Jesus wants you strong. Strong in the will of God, right? Strong in his love. Strong in vision. He wants you to be. Amen. And there's no reason that we can't be. Because we see these people here, they're often overlooked, right? Isn't it true that Anna and Simeon are often overlooked? But they're the first people, right, that that were able to, uh, to articulate, um, you know, who Jesus was. And so they fixed their eyes on, on the Lord, and they were comforted, and uh, they're, ready, they're ready to go. Amen? They, I've seen the Lord, and, and I'm ready to go. 
And God just wants you and I, amen, to be, to be ready. And, um, you know, we're praying for our, uh, our, our brother who's uh, moved over to North Carolina. We're praying for him. And uh, he left, uh, you know, uh, Southern California, Capistrano Beach. And, uh, and so he's never been in, in, you know, inclement weather. And now he's moved over to North Carolina, and, and it's 17 below zero. And, and there's all this stuff and crazy stuff. And, you know, but we're praying. We're praying that, that he can, you know, and his wife, that they can come, uh, you know, closer to Jesus. And um, so keep, keep loved ones in prayer. Everything, you know, that happens, we just have to keep. This is a fun testimony that um, where my sister lives, she's a real strong believer in Coeur d'Alene. Well, they have Christians in their neighborhood and stuff, and they're established. And, um, and so somebody, uh, this, this uh, unbelieving couple moved from who knows where, but they moved into their neighborhood. And so here, here this unbelieving couple is surrounded by beautiful Christians and like they're being ministered to, see? And so it gave me courage too, is that, you know, if, if our loved ones, you know, we, we miss them, but we're praying that they get, you know, planted in the right place and the right people around them and um, so that they can come to know Christ and, and rely on Christ because there's, there's no real life apart from Christ. So see how the drama goes on? in our life, in your life, and things go on. That's why we, we're people, we're people of prayer, persistence. We're in the temple, and, uh, and we're going to see the Lord glorified. And we want our loved ones ready. We want our loved ones ready for his coming. And, of course, we, you know, uh, you know we can't, we can't, you, can, you, you can't shake somebody. And you can't shake common sense into a person, but you can pray you can pray it into a person, right? And, uh, and then God might do a little shaking or something. But, uh, but it's, it's, his, it's his harvest, and it's his world. He's come in humbly, and he's coming for a humble people. And, um, and so, wow, I think we can all just say, Happy birthday, Jesus! Happy birthday, Jesus! So glad that he came, that he loves us. Let's all stand up together.